So welcome to the Management 2110 Chapter 4 lecture based on the readings from the textbook Management 13th edition by Robinson Coulter. Um, if you have the 14th edition, that's fine. I'm using the same information for uh, lecture material and test material from either edition. So no worries on that, and let's get started. So first we'll be covering the learning objectives for chapter two, chapter four, rather, and that's to contrast ethnocentric, polycentric, and geocentric attitudes towards global business. You're gonna develop your skill at collaborating in cross-cultural settings. And you're gonna discuss the importance of regional trade alliances and global trade me mechanisms. We're going to describe the structures and techniques organizations use as they go international. And you're going to explain the relevance of the political slash legal, economic, and cultural environments to global business and know how to be culturally aware. So parochialism. That's viewing the world solely through your own perspectives, leading to an inability to recognize differences between people. And then you have the ethnocentric attitude, and that's the parochialistic belief that the best work approaches and practices are those of the home country. You know, you think of another term, monolingualism, and that's usually indicative that a nation suffers from parochialism. And let me use the United States as an example. You look here, other than the large and growing population of Spanish-speaking people, we generally speak English. So it's highly indicative of our parochialism here. And that's viewing the world solely through one's own eyes and perspectives. People with a parochial attitude do not recognize that others have different ways of living and working. So they ignore others. Um, they ignore the values, the customs, and rigidly apply the attitude of ours is better than theirs to foreign cultures. So. Now, a polycentric attitude is the view that employees in the host country, the foreign country in which the organization is still in business, that they know the best work approaches and practices for running their business. Managers with this attitude view every foreign operation as different and hard to understand. Thus, they're likely to let employees there figure out how best to do things. It's also good to know the geocentric attitude, a world-oriented view that focuses on using the best approaches in people from around the globe. <clears throat> So the European Union, a union of 28 democratic European nations created as a unified economic and trade entity with the euro as a single common currency. So to elaborate a little bit more on that, global competition and the global economy are shaped by regional trading agreements. You're going to hear a lot of them in this chapter, and they include the European Union, uh, the North American Free Trade Agreement, and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, as well as others. Now, the European Union is an economic and political partnership of 28 democratic European countries, like I stated, and eight countries being Croatia, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, Turkey, Albania, Bosnia, Herzegovina, sorry, <laughs> That's hyphenated there, by the way. Iceland, Montenegro, and Serbia. And there are candidates to join the EU. So when the 12 original members formed the EU in 1992, the primary motivation was to reassert the region's economic position against the United States and Japan. Before then, each European nation had border controls taxes and subsidies, nationalistic policies, and protected industries. Now, with these barriers removed, the economic power represented by the EU is very considerable. 
Its current membership covers a population base of more than half a billion people, which is 7% of the world population, and accounts for approximately 20% of the world's global exports and imports. So another step toward for, full unification occurred when the common European currency, the euro, which I just mentioned, was adopted. And the euro is currently in use in 18 of the 28 member states. And all new member countries must adopt the euro. Only Denmark, the United Kingdom, and Sweden have been allowed to opt out of using the euro. So, and this slide shows the 28 democratic European countries that comprise the European Union. The last couple of years were economically difficult for the EU and its members, as they were for many global regions. So, however, things are looking up. And the economic recovery, which began in the mid-2013 range, is expected to continue spreading across countries and gaining strength. So when trade agreements and key issues covered by the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, were reached by the Mexican, Canadian, and U.S. governments in 1992, a vast economic block was created. This is the second largest trade block in the world in terms of uh, combined gross domestic product of its members. Uh, so uh, what you want to remember of the NAFTA is it's an agreement among the Mexican Canadian and U.S. governments in which certain barriers to trade have been eliminated. So the Association of Southeast Asian Countries, known as the ASEAN, that's the acronym for it, is a trade alliance of 10 Southeast Asian nations. The ASEAN region has a population of more than 591 million with a combined gross domestic product of U.S. 1.5 trillion, so pretty significant. In addition to these 10 nations, leaders from a group dubbed ASEAN plus three, which include China, Japan, and South Korea, have met to discuss trade issues. Also, leaders from India, Australia, and New Zealand have participated in trade talks with ASEAN plus three as well. So the main issue with creating a trade block of all 16 nations has been the lack of any push towards regional integration. Despite the Asian culture's emphasis on consensus building, the ASEAN's biggest problem is that individual members haven't been willing to sacrifice for the common good. So despite the barriers and challenges, progress towards regional integration continues. So this fast-growing region means ASEAN and other Asian trade alliances will be increasingly important globally with an impact that eventually could rival both NAFTA and the EU. <clears throat> the World Trade Organization, WTO. It is a global organization of 159 countries that deals with the rules of trade among nations. It was formed in 1995. The World Trade Organization evolved from the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which was the GATT, a trade agreement in effect since the end of World War II. Today, the World Trade Organization is the only global organization that deals with trade rules among nations. Its membership consists of 159 membership countries and 24 observer governments. The International Monetary Fund, the IMF, is an organization of 188 countries that promotes international monetary cooperation and provides member countries with policy advice, temporary loans, and technical assistance to establish and maintain financial stability and to strengthen economies. During the global financial turmoil of the last five few years, the IMF has been on the forefront of advising countries and governments in getting through the difficulties. 
So the World Bank Group is a group of five closely associated institutions, all owned by its member countries, that provides vital financial and technical assistance to developing countries around the world. The goal of the World Bank Group is to promote long-term economic development and poverty reduction by providing members with a technical and financial support. So you have the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. There's another acronym. <laughs> An international economic organization that helps its 30 member countries achieve sustainable economic growth and employment. So today, few companies don't do business internationally. Well, most of them do. However, there's not a generally accepted approach to describe the different types of international companies. Different authors call them different things. The book authors, textbook authors rather, use the terms multinational, multi-domestic, global, and transnational. So a multinational uh, corporation is a broad term. Um, when you hear me reference MNC, this is what I'm referring to. That's the acronym for it. A broad term that refers to any and all types of international companies that maintain operations in multiple countries. A multi-domestic corporation, on the other hand, is an MNC that decentralizes management and other decisions to the local country. Another type of MNC is a global company which centralizes its management and other decisions in the home country. This approach to globalization reflects the ethnocentric attitude. So global companies treat the world market as an integrated whole and focus on the need for global efficiency and cost savings. Although these companies may have considerable global holdings, management decisions with com uh, company-wide implications are made from headquarters in the home country. We have transnational or borderless organization is an MNC in which artificial geographical barriers are eliminated. When organizations do go international, they often use different approaches. Managers who want to get into the global market with minimal investment may start with global sourcing, also called global outsourcing, which is purchasing material or labor from around the world wherever it is cheapest. Makes sense, right? So the goal is to take advantage of lower costs in order to be more competitive. Now the next step in going international may involve exporting the organization's products to other countries. That means essentially they're making products domestically and selling them abroad. In addition, an organization might do importing, which involves acquiring products made abroad and selling them domestically. Both usually entail minimal investment risk, which is why many small businesses often use these approaches to doing global business. So managers also might use licensing or franchising, which are similar approaches involving one organization giving another organization the right to use its brand name, technology, or product specifications in return for a lump sum payment or a fee, it's usually based on sales. The only difference is that licensing is primarily used by manufacturing organizations that make or sell another company's products and franchising is primarily used in service organizations that want to use another company's name and operating methods. So, when an organization has been doing business internationally for a while and has gained experience in international markets, managers may decide to make more of a direct foreign investment. One way is to increase the investment through a strategic alliance, which is a partnership between an organization and a foreign company partner or partners in which both share resources and knowledge in developing new products or building production facilities. For example, Honda Motor and General Electric teamed up to produce a new jet engine. 
Now, a specific type of strategic alliance in which the partners from a separate independent organization for some business purpose is called a joint venture. An example of that would be Hewlett Packard that has had numerous, numerous uh, joint ventures with various suppliers around the globe to develop different components for its computer equipment. These partnerships provide a relatively easy way for companies to compete globally. Finally, managers may choose to directly invest in a foreign country by setting up a foreign subsidiary as a separate and independent facility or office. This subsidiary can be managed as a multi-domestic organization with local control or as a global organization with centralized control. As you could probably guess, this arrangement involves the greatest commitment of resources and poses the greatest amount of risk. So this slide illustrates the different approaches to doing business internationally. Although global sourcing may be the first step to going international for many companies, they often continue to use this approach because of the competitive advantages it offers. So each successive stage of going international beyond global sourcing, however, requires more investment and thus entails more risk for the organization. So managing in a global environment, the political slash legal environment. U.S. managers are accustomed to a stable legal and political system and managers must stay informed of the specific laws in countries where they do business. Some countries have risky political climates. You know, it's uh, not uncommon. So just to expand on this, U.S. managers are accustomed to stable legal and political systems. Changes tend to be slow, and legal and political procedures are very well established. Elections are held at regular intervals, and even when the political party in power changes after an election, it's unlikely that anything too radical will happen. The stability of laws allows for accurate predictions. However, this certainly isn't true for all countries. So managers must stay informed of the specific laws in countries where they do business. For instance, the president of Zimbabwe is pushing ahead with plans to force foreign companies to sell majority stakes to locals. Also, some countries have risky political climates. For instance, BP could have warned Exxon about the challenges of doing business in Russia. During its long involvement in the country, BP has had so many police run-ins that its stock price often nudges up or down in response to raids or arrests of its employees. So keep in mind that a country's political slash legal environment doesn't have to be risky or unstable to be a concern of managers. Just the fact that it differs from that of the home country is important. So managers must recognize these differences if they hope to understand the constraints and opportunities that exist. So a global manager must be aware of economic issues when dealing business in other countries. First, it's important to understand a country's type of economic system. The two major types are a free market economy and a planned economy. A free market economy is one in which resources are primarily owned and controlled by the private sector, whereas a planned economy is one in which economic decisions are planned uh, by a central government. Actually, no economy is purely free, a free market or planned. For instance, the United States and the United Kingdom are toward the free market end of the spectrum, but do have governmental intervention and controls. The economies of Vietnam and North Korea are more planned. <clears throat> China is also more planned, uh, but until recently has been moving toward being a more free market economy. So. Tax policies can be a major economic worry. Some countries' tax laws are more restrictive than those in the uh, multinational corporation's home country. Others are more lenient. So 
About the only certainty is that they differ from country to country. Managers need accurate information on tax rules in countries in which they operate to minimize their business's overall tax obligation. So as we know from Chapter 3, organizations have different cultures. Countries have cultures too. Uh, national culture includes the values and attitudes shared by individuals from a specific country that shape their behavior and their beliefs about what is important. Legal, political, and economic differences among countries are fairly obvious. So getting information about cultural differences isn't quite that easy. Um, the, primary, the primary reason, well, it's difficult for natives to explain their country's unique cultural characteristics to somebody else. So, and here you have natural, uh, national culture, the values and attitudes shared by individuals from a specific country that shape their behavior and beliefs about what is important, not always so easy to explain or articulate to others. And then here you have Hofstede's framework for assessing cultures, one of the most widely referenced approaches to helping managers better understand differences between national cultures. Um, you're going to see that uh, well covered in my chapter review. Um, in the blackboard, you're going to see a Paltoon presentation for the chapter reviews. This is a way to pretty much sum up these lectures. Uh, gives you an overall, which is a nice tool for studying, and then you don't have to go through these lengthy uh, lectures and listen to my voice the whole time. I, you know, I know it's not the most appealing, um, <laughs> but however, um, I decided to uh, shorten the work for you a little bit when it comes down to um, taking those important notes, and I also created some tech-based learning tools with the Jeopardy and matching games too. So you'll see Hofstede's framework. Um, you know, better, more expanded on, um, you know, throughout the uh, chapter summary that I did, as well as, um, you know, the Jeopardy and matching games. So the Global Leadership and Organizational Behavior Effectiveness Program is an ongoing research program that extended Hofstede's work by investigating cross-cultural leadership behaviors and giving managers additional information to help them identify and manage cultural differences. Now, using data from more than 18,000 managers in 62 countries, the GLOBE research team, led by Robert House, identified nine dimensions in which national cultures differ. This is all Hofstede's uh, framework. So, <clears throat> two dimensions, power, distance, and uncertainty avoidance, fit directly with Hofstede's. Now, four are similar to Hofstede's, and that is assertiveness, which is similar to achievement, achievement uh, dash nurturing, humane orientation, which is similar to nurturing dimension, future orientation, which is similar to long-term and short-term orientation, and institutional collectivism, which is similar to individualism and collectivism. So and I have a, uh, another video that expands on Hostie's framework, um, which I highly recommend that you look at. So the uh, GLOBE studies confirm that Hostie's dimensions are still valid and extend his research rather than replace it. Uh, Globes added dimensions uh, provide it and expand it and update it measure of countries' cultural differences. It's likely that cross-cultural studies of human behavior and organizational practices will increasingly use the globe dimensions to uh, assess differences between countries. Nevertheless, for test purposes, no Hofstede's and take advantage of some of the, uh, you know, uh, additional learning tools I put in the Blackboard for you. So global management in today's world. 
Now, globalization creates challenges because of the openness that's necessary for it to work. One challenge is the increased threat of terrorism by a truly global terror network. So globalization is meant to open up trade and break down the geographic barriers separating countries. Yet, opening up means just that, being open to the bad as well as the good. So for global leadership and organizational behavior effect effectiveness globe program that I talked about earlier, um, it's definitely a uh, concern when it comes down to globalization. And we're going to go on with global management in today's world. You have the challenges of openness that we just talked of and that's spoke of. And that's the increased threat of terrorism by a truly global terror network. It's something that you definitely have to be concerned of when doing uh, business in foreign countries now. Um, economic interdependence of trading countries. And then you have intense underlying and fundamental cultural differences. Uh, differences that encompass uh, traditions, history, religious beliefs, and deep-seated values. Okay, so you don't want to go over to these countries, go global, and then start offending people. Um, know their traditions, know their history, and know their values. So you have cultural intelligence, that's cultural awareness and sen sensitivity skills. And then you have a global mindset. And attributes that attributes that allow a leader to be effective in cross-cultural environments. So as globalization continues to be important for business, it's obvious that managers need to understand how to best manage that global workforce. So some researchers have suggested that managers need cultural intelligence or cultural awareness, um, you know, uh, sensitivity skills. You have cultural intelligence encompasses the three main dimensions. That's cultural uh, knowledge of the cultural. Like I said, you don't want to be uh, offensive. You don't want to try to do business somewhere else and not know the background. Uh, mindfulness, and that's the ability to pay attention to signals and reactions in different cross-cultural situations, and behavioral skills, using one's knowledge and mindfulness to choose appropriate behaviors. So here you have intellectual capital. That's the knowledge of international business and the capacity to understand how business works on a global scale. You have psychological capital. That's openness to new ideas and experiences. And you have social capital, which I used earlier, and that's the ability to form connections and building trust, trusting relationships with people who are different than you. And that can be also internal, right? And social capital is extremely important within the organization. So why, why it's important, while it's important to the external environment, it's also important internal with the organizational culture. So starting our review with the first learning outcome, uh, contrasts ethnocentric, polycentric, and geocentric attitudes towards global business. Remember that parochialism is viewing the world solely through your own eyes and perspectives and not recognizing that others have different ways of living and working. An ethnocentric attitude is, that, is the parochial belief that the best work approaches and practices or those of the home country. Also, we learned that a polycentric attitude is the view that the managers in the host country know the best work approaches and practices for running their business. And a geocentric attitude is a world-oriented view that focuses on using the best approaches and people from around the globe. So moving on to the second learning outcome, discuss the importance of regional trading alliances and global trade mechanisms. Remember that the European Union consists of 28 democratic countries with eight countries having applied for membership. 17 countries have adopted the euro and all new member countries must adopt it. NAFTA continues to help Canada, Mexico, and the United States strengthen 
their global economic power. The U.S. CAFTA alliance is still trying to get off the ground, as is the pr proposed FTAA. So because of the delays for the CAFTA and the FTAA, the southern common market will likely take on new importance. Also remember, ASEAN is a trading alliance of 10 Southeast Asian nations, a region that remains important in the global economy, and the African Union and SAARC are relatively new, but will continue to see benefits from their alliances. Continuing with a second learning outcome, you need to know to counteract some of the risks in the global trade, the World Trade Organization plays an important role in monitoring and promoting trade relationships. Also, the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, and the World Bank Group are two entities that provide monetary support and advice to their member countries. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development assists its member countries with financial support in achieving sustainable economic growth and employment. So moving on to reviewing the third outcome, describe the structures and techniques organizations use as they go international. Remember that a multinational co uh, corporation is an international company that maintains operations in multiple countries. A multi-domestic organization is an MNC that decentralizes management and other decisions to the local country, which is the polycentric attitude we spoke about earlier. Remember? Okay, so a global organization is an MNC that centralizes management and other decisions in the home country, which is ethnocentric attitude. And then you have a transnational organization, and that's the geocentric attitude, and it's an MNC that has eliminated artificial geographic barriers and uses the best work practices and pr approaches from wherever. Continuing with the third outcome, know that global sourcing is purchasing materials or labor from around the world wherever it is cheapest. Also know exporting is making products domestically and selling them abroad. Importing is acquiring products made abroad and selling them domestically. And also with the third learning outcome you need to know that licensing is used by manufacturing organizations that make or sell another company's products and gives that organization the right to use the company's brand name, technology, or product specifications. Franchising, on the other hand, is similar, but usually used by service organizations that want to use another company's name and operating methods. So know that a global strategic alliance is a partnership between an organization and foreign company and partners in which they share resources and knowledge to develop new products or build facilities. Remember that a joint venture is a specific type of strategic alliance in which the partners agree to form a separate independent organization for some business purpose. A foreign subsidiary is a direct investment in a foreign country that a company creates by establishing a separate and independent facility or office. So moving on to the fourth and final outcome, explain the relevance of the political, legal, and economic and cultural environments to global business. You should remember that the laws and political stability of a country are issues in the global political slash legal environment with which managers must be very familiar with. Likewise, managers must be aware of a country's economic issues such as currency exchange rates, inflation rates, 
and tax policies. So finally, remember that Geert Hofstede identified five dimensions for assessing a country's culture, including individualism, dash collectivism, power distance, uncertainty avoidance, achievement dash nurturing, and long-term slash short-term orientation. The globe studies identified nine dimensions for assessing country cultures, them being power distance, uncertainty avoidance, assertiveness, humane orientation, future orientation, institutional collectivism, gender differentiation, and in-group collectivism, and performance orientation. Thank you for participation and for your participation in Chapter 4 lecture and stay tuned for the Chapter 5 lecture. Until then, check Blackboard for the week's activities and assignments. Thank you.